And number two, we have uh, the souls, we have a dramatization of what happens to us in erotic entanglements with each other. The soul, psyche, goes through an ordeal, suffers, and is, has all of these tasks imposed upon her, which is what happens to the soul in erotic entanglements. And he says most of the people who come in for analysis are usually there because of an erotic entanglement or something wrong with their marriage or something that has to do with the sphere of love. And um, it also shows how uh, man's relationship to the gods needs to be right, otherwise uh, these pathologizings and symptoms happen and they announce themselves as uh, the soul's need for attention and so forth. So he says this is the new myth of analysis and uh, this is uh, superior to uh, Jung and Freud. So that's the paper that he delivers in uh, the myth of analysis. And then um, before we move into revisioning psychology, I think maybe we'll just take a five minute break and uh, come back to it. Well, everybody, this is tough for everybody. You worked 20 years in this thing, you did a good job. It was that kind of difference 20 years ago. Yeah, even, yeah even then. Even if you've got a gold right. watch, now they get rid of you on a timetable so they don't have to pay you any benefits. Right, and yeah, and you're lucky if you get benefits. That's I mean, the whole deal is to get rid of you before you get benefits, right. no matter what your job is. And yeah. the funny thing is that, that the, the Generation Xers are, are looking at the baby boomers like, what are you complaining about? They're, because they're like, oh, well, I am my own island, so therefore I'll go from job to job, and I will take my skills with me when I go. And, you know, so they're, they're growing up in this atmosphere, and they're wondering what, not, what our nostalgia is all about. Well, it's, it's pretty pathetic, because what it does is take somebody that has a lot of creativity, that is a good producer, that is a good person, and it sort of devalues them to the point where it ruins them. I mean, they think, what's wrong with me? There's nothing wrong with me. Well, that's, that's, that's a lot of what, what's wrong with me in this society. What's wrong with oh, the, a lot of that attitude? One asks about a lot yeah. in this society. And what's it's, it's, it's causing a lot. I mean, I hate to say you're, par that you're being paranoid, but I mean, that's, it's been really designed no, that way. It, it's a phase of history. I, I think it's worth putting it in a historical perspective. It, it's not going to stay this way. Oh, no, it's, no. it's a kind of <clears throat> you know, life in this society is generally safer than it has ever been, and correspondingly more dull. Who, who, you know, how many of us are um, put through, a, you know, a life-threatening experiences? You know, we don't have wars in this country. We have crime, and the crime's getting worse. But really, the the possibility, of, you know, displaced population, the kind of European history where people are constantly uprooted and their homes are wiped out, and there's constant warfare, and you know, Napoleon goes marching through your town. And, I mean, that's a whole different. That's a whole different life experience. At least there, you're put in touch with a sense of being alive and you know participating in, in that tradition, the I tradition know, of that nation state warfare. I have a wonderful warfare. friend who's from Trinidad, and he's got this great big Jeffrey Holder accent. He says, he says, Malcolm, you Americans, you think you're supposed to live forever. We here in the third world, we know. You get bitten by a bug today, you're dead tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> we have no expectation that we're supposed to live the, forever. <laughs> in the third world. No, it's fine here if you get bitten by a bug, they'll take you in and work right, on it. Exactly. But you've got to have insurance, and if your job doesn't right, have insurance, you then have you're going to get billed for it, and yeah. if you can't pay the bills, <laughs> and the shame and is, is that you don't live forever because you didn't, have, you didn't have the wherewithal to have the insurance. And that, and that puts you on a shame spiral. Right, right. <laughs> yeah, it's crazy. It's definitely a phase. I'm, I'm quite convinced that catastrophes are on the way and will come. They, they inevitably do. There will be mass catastrophes, and displaced populations, particularly with, um, with respect to the deforestation going on in the equatorial zones and the displaced populations that are constantly being shifted north towards our borders, it's going to be a nightmare. And you're basing that on... We're, we're just in a sort of pox romana right now, a very quiet uh, phase, but they never last. The quiet periods don't last. Uh -huh. Maybe a century or two. Historical perspective? Just on historical inference from looking at other civilizations, looking at how long stable periods last, you know, a century or two at the most. And, uh, and America is the biggest, um, far bigger than the Roman Empire was. Oh, yeah, you know. it's gigantic. I mean, our America is, yeah, that's know, right. it's, a, it's a huge structure that will affect really have a big... I mean, you know, when you look at our infrastructure and everything else, everything is digitized and, and, and going on the, the most gossamer of, uh, uh, of threads that we, you know, we're, we're surviving on um, basically, you know, basically photons flying through the air, you know, yeah. or, or, or traveling down a, 
a very thin wire. Yes. Just think of that. <laughs> <laughs> wow. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Also, we finish up with questions. You've been psychology here. Um, Revisioning Psychology came out in 1975. The lectures that it was based on were delivered in 1972. And um, the book was nominated for a Pulitzer. It's very well written. It's also uh, requires, it does require concentration uh, to read. It's a bit of a challenge. But uh, it's broken up into four distinct sections. And uh, each of the four sections uh, kind of advertises one of Hellman's primary ideas with respect to archetypal psychology. Personifying. He tells uh, chapter one is personifying or imagining things. Chapter two is pathologizing or falling apart. Chapter three is psychologizing or seeing through. And chapter four is dehumanizing or soul making. And each of these terms is a kind of central tenet uh, of his um, archetypal psychology. Now, as you read the opening chapter on personifying, what he does is he comes in and says, I'm basically going to speak in metaphors, in metaphoric language. And this is something that isn't done anymore. Metaphors have been chased out of existence by uh, the scientific endeavor, but I'm really coming out of the Renaissance. And, and during the Renaissance, personifying, that is personifying things like virtue as a goddess, justice as a goddess, uh, eros and the Eros and Psyche story, personifications of abstract philosophical ideas as divine little beings. This is what he means by personifying things, or imagining things. He says the Renaissance was really the height of this. Um, there were tons of personifications, and um, you would find, you know, it's a sort of capital letter phenomenon that you get as you're reading a text. The capital letter is personified as uh, justice, virtue, fidelity, temperance, and all of that. And the reason Hillman has such an affinity with the Renaissance is because during the Renaissance, uh, you remember that um, right about 1453, just before the Renaissance really moves into its great phase with Michelangelo and Leonardo and Raphael, the uh, cause and sort of inspiration of that were all of these Greek monks who were spilt out of Byzantium. Uh, which at the time, Constantinople, was being taken over by the Arabs. They finally took it in 1453 and displaced all of these Greek monks. And the Greeks had, uh, the Greek monk monks had kept up the Greek learning, which for the most part had fallen into destitute in the West. Uh, nobody really knew how to translate into Greek. So all these Greek scholars come over to the courts of the Medici, and um, they start teaching the Medici how to be Greek, and Marcello Ficino and Pico della Mirandola, in particular, are the primary architects there. And the texts that are brought over by the Greeks consist of the entire works of Plato, Plotinus, and the Corpus Hermeticum. Basically everything that is labeled as Neoplatonic philosophy. We'll get more into this on the next class because it has to do with the Anima Mundi, the idea of the entire universe as graded into these stages. And uh, just as a brief, um, you have, um, in Plotinus you have the one, which is the radiant, the single point that can be personified as the sun. It's the one from out of which everything comes, and then you have the new, which is the Greek word for mind, and this is the mind within which Plato's forms dwell. Everything that evolves out of this uh, is modeled on the Platonic forms in the divine mind. And then radiating out from the divine mind is the anima mundi. And the difference between the anima mundi, the anima mundi is essentially all the planets and the constellations, everything from the Empyrean on down. <coughs> is the soul of the universe. And it's different in that the platonic forms of the divine mind, the new, are incorruptible, but static. The forms in the anima mundi are also incorruptible, but active. The planets are in motion. And it is as a result of the, their motion that everything that happens on the next realm down, nature is formed and connected by influences from the anima mundi. The word influenza uh, comes out of this astrological influences, that everything that happens on Earth happens as a result of these astrological influences exerted by the Anima Mundi through something called a vinculum, which is a link between the archetypal world of the planets up above and the natural world down below. And the natural world is made up out of form and matter. Everything is based on complexity, and so everything can fall apart. 